Hi everyone, Professor King here. Um, in this video today, I'm going to I'm going to be discussing uh, two texts. Um, so instead of two two web teaches, there's just going to be one for this week. I will be talking about Gloria Anseldua's um, excerpt from uh, Borderlands La Frontera, the New Mestiza, and I'll be talking about uh, uh, the excerpt from Louis Althusser's uh, ideological state apparatuses. So um, buckle in. I promise it won't be long because again, I know we, you know, we're inundated right now. So I'm going to make this as short and sweet as I possibly can. And in doing so, I will take it to the share screen. Before I do, I'd like to always remind you that, uh, you know, if uh, to go at your own pace with this, to pause as you are taking notes, and to go back to certain things I explain and describe so that they make sense. Um, please contact me um, when you have questions. I'm more than happy to clarify those for you and to help. Um, and yeah, just all the stuff. So um, again, like I said, the first one we'll be talking about is the New Mestiza by Gloria Anseldua, um, which is from Borderlands La Frontera, which is a, um, a text of hers, a theoretical text, um, very famous theoretical text that she wrote when she was still alive. She's since passed, unfortunately, but this is Gloria right here, just, you know, a nice, nice lady. Um, and, um, you know, let's, let's, let's go into this. Um, so there are some concepts that I would like for you to keep in mind as you are reading this text and kind of as we approach it. And I'll, I'll share these first so that we have premises, right? So that we have sort of like a base understanding of where we are going in terms of uh, Ansel Dua's argument. The first one, and this isn't necessarily a term that she uses a lot uh, because she uses the second one you see there, um, but this idea of liminality and nepontal. Um, so liminality is this idea of like um see this door behind me it's the door to my guest room um liminality is this idea of of existing in between or among two different spaces or two or more spaces two or more cultural spaces two or more identity spaces um you know or literally like two rooms right um so in a liminal space right? You kind of don't truly fully exist in one space or another. So in other words, if I stood right in the middle of this door behind me, um, I wouldn't fully be in my dining area where I'm broadcasting from you now, and I wouldn't fully be in my guest room, right? I'd be in between those two spaces, but I'd be able to sort of interact with and probably walk into and out of both. Um, and so when, when Ansel Lua talks about the mestizo or mestiza culture, this is in part what she's referencing is this idea of the Nepantal. The Nepantal is an apatal term that she uses, um, but the closest sort of approximation that we have in um, theory specifically is this notion of liminality. Um, so people who are mestizo, meaning, meaning like um, of mixed ethnic origin, which a lot of people from, uh, you know, um, Latin American and particularly Mexican culture are, um, you know, they don't fully exist um, in, in either one, especially if we're talking about Mexican Americans, right, which Ansel Dua is. So it's this, you know, you're not fully sort of from, you know, you didn't grow up and live in Mexico your whole life. You didn't, you, you, you didn't, you know, um, at least, you know, for, for the purposes of like, you know, nationhood and all that, um, we can argue about indigenous rights and all that, but for the purposes of like America now as this sort of like late stage capitalist white supremacist country, right? Like you didn't fully grow up in that either. So you're just kind of, you know, she's the child of Mexican immigrants, Mexican farm, Mexican American farm work, working family. So, um, you know, there is definitely that sense of liminality of kind of existing in both spaces and neither. Which leads to this notion of like, since there are multiple identities, there are also mo multiple oppressions. Um, Anzal Dua is a big is a big proponent, big um, sort of grandmommy, if you will, of of um, talking in theory, right, uh, in the theoretical world about things like 
um, you know, the, the focus on, on indigenous people's rights. Um, I put indigenous nest there, but that's a little, that's a, that's a weird word for me. Um, so recognizing sort of, you know, um, you know, recognizing that we are all on stolen land, right? Recognizing that this is, this is rightfully indigenous land. Uh, I know it's, 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 uh, commonly referred to as, as Turtle Island, right? This, this space where we're existing on. Um, and that there are a number of um, tribe, tribal nations uh, in whose spaces, right? Like uh, the, the colonizing presence has, has uh, for lack of a better term, like steamrolled or stepped over, right? Um, another identity that she associates with is the farm worker identity, because as I said, her family um, are a family of farmers. And she talks about this in her excerpt, especially in terms of applying it right to um, to academic study. And I absolutely love this because what she says, right, is like to take that 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 hard work, that work ethic of the farm worker, which is just like someone like me who's just like, I mean, I might as well be like made of paper mache. I could never understand working that hard. Um, but just taking that sort of work ethic and then applying it to, to academics, right, and to theory and to discussing these, um, you know, these issues um, in an academic and scholarly way, I think is very significant, right, is very important because the stereotypes and sort of the damaging language around um, people of, of indigenous descent, people of Chicanx or Latin, uh, Latinx descent, right, are, um, you know, it can often be these, you know, like very uh, limiting and dehumanizing terms of like, oh, you know, the, you know, the whatever, right? Like the, the we've heard all of them, so I'm not gonna damage anyone by repeating them here, but Ansel Dua kind of puts that all into question and says, no, actually like this, this, ethnic and cultural tradition is one of like insanely hard work, right? Um, and you know, that doesn't, th that's, there's no far stretch here. Like we've all seen those images from the most recent California fires of farm workers, um, literally in like red atmospheric <laughs> conditions, right? Like no blue sky anywhere, it's beat red. Um, and they're working, right? They're working tirelessly. Um, through these very dangerous and unhealthy conditions, right? So um, Anzal Du is kind of putting that forth and saying like, hey, um, you know, that same sort of laborious, not laboriousness, but labor intensive approach to farm work can be applied to intellectual labor as well. Um, Anzal Du is also a queer Chicanx woman um, and, and those, those multiple identity markers definitely uh, arise from, from her discussions. So keep all of these in mind, um, but we'll go on. So I want you to, you know, instead of, instead of giving away too much of this text, cause this is a great read. Like I'm, I'm no dummy to think that like everyone is reading my, you know, reading all of my assigned readings religiously but, and some people are just watching the web teaches, but if you are going to read a theoretical text, this is one of the ones that I would say is, is pretty enjoyable. It's pretty engaging. It's, it's, it's so relevant to so many discussions we're having right now in 2020. Um, and it's relevant to where we are in Southern California. Um, so many things, right? So, 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 you know, please, do what is, do the bare minimum of what is expected of you and, and read the readings. I don't know how else to put that. Um, but as you're reading, think about these questions and try and answer them as you take notes and read. Um, first off, why do you think that the new Mestiza is written partly in Spanish, partly in English, and part, partly in Nahuatl, right? Um, why do you think, because Ansel Dua specifically asked, not to have it all translated into English by the Norton editors. You know, people like Foucault and even Althusser, who we'll look at in a second, they're translated from the French. There are theorists translated from any number of other languages. Ansel Dua says no, right? In, all of these need to be included 
in this theoretical text. Think about why that might be. Why have, why have three languages interacting with one another and someone speaking them interchangeably throughout this theoretical text? What, she, what is she trying to get at there, right? What's the subtext of just doing that? And my next question as you're reading is, what is a mestiza consciousness, right? How does she apply a mestiza consciousness to the following groups? Um, first off, people of color, indigenous people and Chicanos or Chicanx, right? Um, I wrote these notes a few years ago before that was a little more widely in use, so I will update that. Um, women, um, queer people, or, or if you prefer LGBTQIA+, um, and the poor, right? Because these are definitely, again, identity markers that she identifies with, but that are also of oppressed groups and of people who possess, you know, when people possess all or some or even one of these, like, what does that mean? What does that, what is she saying? Also consider, right, how do you think the new Mestiza consciousness is different from the, quote, clash of cultures between colonizers and colonized people of the past, right? And that's part of this El Retorno um, section. Um, I have the second edition. So in the second edition, it's on page uh, 2108. But, you know, there's a reason why I, I did this after our discussion of Orientalism, because again, Orientalism specifically is about Asian and Northern African cultures, but it definitely influences all of these other writings and discussions and is influenced by these other writings and discussions like chicken X and, and uh, critical race theory and all those sorts of things. So, you know, in order to understand, um, I wanted to make sure we had that, that sort of baseline of colonized or colonized uh, power dynamics that people like Said and Spivak discuss before we get to, before we got to Ansel Dua. But now that we know that, right, um, Again, how do you think this mestiza consciousness is different from what Anzaldúa calls that class of cultures between colonizers and colonized people of the past? Um, so, so be able to answer that. And then finally, why do you think Anzaldúa ends this chapter focusing on rebirth or what she calls renacimientos de la tierra madre, right? Like, what do you think it means and what tone does that set if at the end, if in the conclusion, we're talking about rebirth? Right. Um, so again, the, if you, when you have answers to these questions, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of when they'll do it. And I'll be honest with you, this is probably one of the more accessible texts. You know, this isn't Foucault. This isn't uh, this isn't Nietzsche. This is a little more accessible for us in terms of a theoretical text. So that's why I say, you know, it's a cool read, especially when we can apply it uh, to Ava Luna, which we will do right now, um, or at least I'll ask you to, right? I want you to think about after you've read through Anzaldúa, um, you know, pivot to Ava Luna and keep Anzaldúa in mind as you're reading chapter two of Ava Luna. Um, so the first question is, where do we see a Mestiza consciousness or at least a Mestiza presence in the novel? Um, I mean, we, we already saw some in chapter one, so we can just build on there. We're starting to see other ones. So, all right. Um, do we see any characters who embody first an inner resistance and then a social one? As, as Ansel Dua describes them. Um, how does Allende portray those who erect and sometimes violently protect borders? So Allende, right, is not talking about uh the border conflict here in the united states right it's a it's a made-up south american country but we can kind of guess which one she's alluding to um so so but there are parallels right there are parallels um literarily between literature and real life right so what's what's a yende saying about people who erect and violently protect borders um, and actually in this chapter, um, you know, we're not even, we're going to a whole nother continent, right? We're going to Europe and things like that. So I believe I'm, my brain's not working. Um, so be ready to share some examples from the novel. And keep in mind, we talked about epistemic violence with Spivak, and we're going to reiterate this discussion, this concept 
with Anzaldúa, right? Where violence is something that can, can happen not just physically, but at the level of creating knowledge, at the level of knowledge production. Um, I'll give you an example from real life so that you can think about this and kind of apply it to Ava Luna. This is not in Ava Luna, right? Um, but when I was when I was young in the 90s, they had this um, this similar to like the the voting that's going on now. We have different measures and things like that. And one of the things on the ballot was to create um, what they called full immersion, full English emerge, immersion, which meant that um, students who were from non English speaking immigrant homes, when they came to school, they could only speak English. There were no other languages um taught i mean other than like when you get to high school and you take a second you know you take a foreign language um there were no other languages allowed at the at the pedagogical level right like you can't teach a class in another language um and so what happened i mean what that says is that there is a privileging right of one language over others that there's a privileging over specifically english to say uh, Khmer or Spanish or Vietnamese or any number of other languages that are spoken, particularly in Southern California. Um, so how is that epistemic violence, right? If we are saying that your knowledge is, your languages, right, your, your ways of producing and disseminating knowledge through language are not allowed, only English is allowed, what then happens to those people who speak those languages at home? How are they um, tr either treated differently or even disenfranchised by this system? Well, clearly, right? Um, it's much easier to, to learn things like phonics and addition and subtraction and social studies when it's taught in a language that you know versus not, right? And so when you are already at a disadvantage because the privileging of one language over another is occurring in your very school or in your very school system, um, that's a form of epistemic violence, right? Because you're not any less intelligent than someone who speaks a different language. It's just, again, that language uh, is being privileged. So we have to question why, right? Um, but anyway, going back to Anzaldu and Allende, right? Think about this notion of epistemic violence in terms of how it occurs or how you're starting to see it occur in the novel. It doesn't have to be that example, but that's just one of many examples of epistemic violence, right? And then think of how oppressed groups like the ones Anzaldu mentions are represented in the novel. Um, you know, people of not just, um, diverse ethnic origins, but queer people, women, right, um, people who are part of the working class or, you know, in this case, the, the sort of uh, farm workers or rural laborers or domestic uh, laborers or the servant class, right, um, think about how they might be, be represented in the novel and what Anzaldúa is saying there. Um, so, oops, that's from, don't, See, you guys are so lucky. I used to quiz my classes when we had face-to-face -face and you don't even get quizzes, so. So easy. Um, all right, so that's, uh, that's Ansel Dua. So now let's go to Altisera. Very, very different in some ways, similar in others. Um, so Louis Altisera, French guy, um, just a little background on him and this may I'm just going to say it might color your perception of Altisere. Um, so Altisere is a, um, you know, is a, uh, is a, is a, is a Marxist thinker, the thinkers, th Marxist thinker, um, is concerned with then capital, right, is concerned with labor production. Again, when we're talking about Marxism, there's a lot of ridiculous empty rhetoric in terms of what that, what people who have not done any study in that field think that it means. Um, but all when we're talking about theory and we're talking about Marxist theory, all we are talking about is the creation of labor, right? And the creation of capital, uh, labor to, to further that creation of capital, right? Um, of, of resources, of goods, of things we consume. Um, and then that, that as Altisera discusses in this piece, 
um, shapes and forms and is, is essentially sort of the, uh, the source for ideology. Um, you know, just to get, kind of give you a little bit of a side, you know, these people who say like, oh, these fringe groups are Marxist, rah, right? Like, like they're all gonna, I, I don't know what, it, like if you've ever met a Marxist, they're usually like pale and sickly and, you know, like on a poor, not all vegan diets are poor, but like these are the kind that, you know, just like eat Oreos and like Oreos are vegan. Um, and, 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 you know, like read books and stuff. Like the, the Marxists are not gonna like, you know, hurt anyone really. Um, but they always have this like, oh, they have a Marxist agenda. And it's like, well, I mean, yeah, in the sense that they're like critiquing like late stage capitalism and like the fact that like one person is worth a trillion dollars why, while, I don't know, however many million in our country, 60 million or something like that are living below the poverty line or starving or homeless. And uh, so many people around the world, you know, like, of course, the people with that kind of power are going to be, you know, throwing these scare tactic, tactics saying that, you know, this, this, this critique of capitalism is such a bad thing. Um, and this just saying that capitalism doesn't necessarily work for everyone is a bad thing. <laughs> um, you know, always consider the source, in other words. Anyway, I digress. Let's move on. Um, so Altusser is talking about ideology. And when we think about ideology, the first thing we probably think of is what's going on in our brains, right? What are we thinking? Like, um, people will think of like brainwashing, right? Or, or um, um, dogmatic beliefs or things like that. But it always has, you know, when people think about ideology, they always go to like the brain and how we think. And this is where Althusser spots a lack, right? We always talk about how the theorist spots a lack in the discussion and then creates the space. So what Althusser does is, you know, he's talking about how the aim of I ideology is to re reproduce those things that ensure production. In other words, labor power, work, right? Um, and how do we do that? Well, we do that via skills and obedience to the status quo, right? And so if we think about that, right, if we think about labor itself, if we think about labor production, if we think about power dynamics, if we think about obedience, if we think about instilling and building skills, those don't just happen up here. They happen in our practice, in our behavior, in our discussions, right, in our interactions with one another. So in other words, to Althusser, ideology is not something that's thought, it's something that is behaved, right? It's something that is interacted. And that, I mean, this is a good place to pause because that should blow your mind, right? If our ideology is a white supremacist ideology, how are the ways in which our actions as a society encourage that, keep that as a norm, right? Um, how are the ways in which we interact with one another maintaining the status quo of white supremacy or of patriarchy or of, um, you know, an anti-immigration or xenophobic lens, right? Not just, the, not just the way we think, but the stuff we do in everyday life. How does everything we do in everyday life contribute to ideology? Any number of ideologies, right? And if you think about capitalist ideology, since we're talking about labor and capital and Marxism, right? Think about it. Capitalism would not exist if it were just in our heads. Capitalism has to be practiced, right? We've got to buy our iPhones. We've got to, you know, spend money on our, on our Yeezy shoes. We've got to, you know, um, we've got to work to be able to afford rent and to be able to pay our landlords and to be able to do all of these things, right? So this is exactly what he's talking about. He's saying, right, that this notion that ideology is up here, if it were up here, nothing would ever happen. It, ha it in order for it to, to proliferate, right, it has to exist in behavior. Sorry, someone's outside my door. I'm gonna shut it real quick. 
All right. So just to give you a little, a little tiny bit of a background, I mean, you know, if you've ever, if you've ever just written, you know, into the catalog, library catalog, Karl Marx and his, his ideas, I mean, he's got books that are huge. So um, this is a very, 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 very tiny understanding of Marx's very complex theories, right? But Marx talks about base and superstructure, right? And so the base and superstructure interact with one another in order for society to maintain this sort of status quo. And if we think about the word status quo, that means it's static. And that's one thing that one thing that Althusser is criticized for is there's no room to change in this model. But before we get there, let's talk about base and superstructure. So the structure of human society has a base at the bottom. Those are all things that are needed to produce. So things like, you know, the actual materials that grow out of the ground, trees, food, um, iron ore for your cell phones, right? Any number of things, factories, raw materials, um, the people's relations to production, okay? So it's the stuff, right? It's the means that when we talk about the means of production, that's what we're talking about, the stuff that we need, right, in order to produce. Um, and this shapes the superstructure. And what is the superstructure? It's everything that has nothing to do with production in society. So things like education, family, religion, politics, media, branding, um, you know, those would all be part of the superstructure because they're, they're abstracts, right? They're things that that maintain and legitim legitimizes, legitimates, I, I did not create this image, um, legitimizes the base, right? So, <clears throat> you know, if you think about like, um, let's talk about like media, right? Because, you know, a lot of, a lot of students talk about like the media and how that shapes our perception of society, yada, yada, right? So let's say, right, you have, um, you have like a beauty ad campaign, right? Um, the media, right, in sort of instilling these very um, cis heteropatriarchal um, white supremacist ideas, right, says like, oh, in order to be beautiful, you have to have blue eyes and blonde hair and high cheekbones and you have to be thin and you have to have these size breasts and whatever else, right? That is, all of that messaging, all of that sort of abstraction is the superstructure. Well, then the base would be things like the lipstick, right? The, um, the ingredients of, uh, that we pull together to create a diet shake. Um, the people who create those items, who work in the factories, um, the factories where they're created, right? Um, and so these two things are constantly interacting to create the structure of society, at least from, again, um, a materialist uh, point of view, right? Labor production point of view. So <clears throat> let's come back to Althusser. Althusser is talking about ideological apparatuses. And he says there are two kinds. There are, and these are the things, apparatuses are things that keep us obedient, keep us producing, right? Um, and he, so he says there's two that keep us in line. One are repressive state apparatuses. And when he, may, when he says state, he doesn't mean like a state like California, he's talking about like governments. So that could be countries, nations, could be local states, um, any governing body of a, of a community, right? So these repressive state apparatuses function by exertion of power and violence, both in the physical and the epistemological sense, right? Um, so things like, um, you know, if you, if you protest and um, you know something about your protest does not please the state, the state, right? And it's and it's uh, it's it's places of power, right? Of power exertion. Then you could get arrested. You could get stomped. You could get killed, right? Um, so that would be the the an example of a repressive state apparatus, it, meaning it literally represses you it, 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 through um, physical or violent means. But then, and, but then, you know, 
um, all to say saying really like those are like the more extreme. Um, the, the main ones that govern most of our life are ideological state apparatuses. These are part of the private, private domain. They're beyond the legal, right? Um, so whereas like a lawyer would, would, a prosecutor would enact epistemic violence against you by pleading a case against you and getting you incarcerated, right? That would be a repressive state apparatus. Things like school, church, the family, the media, the legal system, um, culture and arts, these are things that keep you in line um, just by, by shaping your daily lives, right? You go to school and what do they tell you at school, right? If you act out, you're not going to do well. If you don't pay attention, you're not going to do well. If you think for yourself, you're not going to do well. If you don't conform to the expectations of the English 104 class, you're not going to do well, right? But they also get you ready to be laborers, right? Why are you at Fullerton College? Are you here to further your knowledge and to become critical thinkers? Are you here because you want a bachelor's degree or some sort of certification degree so that you can get a good job? Just saying, right? And it's not your fault. It's this, it's the way that this whole system is set up, right? Um, church, right? Your families. Um, you know, why do we, why do we assume in this very traditional sense that is only very recently being critiqued and questioned in the course, you know, throughout the course of history, why do we assume, assume that the father is the head of the family, right? Why do we assume that a family is um, two heterosexual parents, right? Why do we assume that family um, even involves things like parents and children and not friends, right? Um, so all of these are, are things that shape our lives to make us, again, obedient producers to, to keep the base and the superstructure uh, as, as a functioning unit in society. And the, they're diverse, but they're unified insofar as they uphold ideology, right? A school is very different from a church, which is very different from a family, right? They perform very different functions, but they uphold the ideology of any given society. And whereas repressive state apparatuses function clearly by repression, ideological state apparatuses or ISAs function by ideology and exploitation. Right? And when we say exploitation, we mean exactly that. We mean that there is a select few at top who are benefiting from the overwhelming work at the bottom. And these people are getting a lot less than these people up here, right? Um, so how do you, so now to turn it to yourselves, and this is another place where you might wanna really pause and think about this stuff. How do each of these ISAs, these ideological state apparatuses, how do they function to exploit their subjects? And their subjects, right, really meaning you and me and everybody. So how does school or church or the family or the media or the legal system or culture and arts, how do they work to exploit the people who have, you know, as you go down, less and less power? Maybe pause, take a few minutes and think about each one. And then go vote or cry, whatever. All right, I'm going to move on. All right, so we talked about subjects, so I want to kind of um, come back a little bit and then we'll be done. Um, so how does one become a subject, right? How are we, how, how do we just sort of stumble, all stumble, all of us, every single member of a society. How do we stumble into this system and become subjects? What's the process by which we become the subject, right? The exploited subject. Well, Althusser talks about it in terms of this notion of what's called interpolation. And what interpolation um, is, it's at the, is, it is the hailing or identifying of a subject and it's how ideology is maintained, right? So interpol interpolation does not just happen once. It can be any number 
of hailings and hailings meaning like, hey, you are X, right? Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, so the, the subject, right, is hailed or interpolated as such, right? When we're born, if we want to think about this in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the uh, oppressive gender binary, right? When we're born, or even before we're born, speaking of the California fires, right, the West Coast fires, how are we interpolated? It's a boy, it's a girl right before we are even allowed to make that decision for ourselves and again as, as sedgwick and others point out there are other choices um so you're born it's a boy right that is interpolation because that is a hailing that is a saying you tiny eight pound baby right you are this thing that i call you and then before you as a baby into maybe two, three years old, even have an idea of, of what that means and all of the things that are associated with that, you are that thing, right? You're hailed as it, you recognize that you are such, you recognize other subjects, maybe female, male, right? And again, if our ideology does not make space for anything else, it doesn't, you know, by and large, it's not allowed to exist above, you know, at, a, at an above liminal level, right? It's not allowed to exist in, in, in the public sort of ideological functionings of a society, even though it, it may exist in other spaces, right? And then everyone agrees implicitly or explicitly upon this ideology. Right. And, and I think gender is such a fascinating way to consider this. Right. Because then if, if we have these gender reveals and before someone is even born, they are interpolated or hailed as male or female. And then not until they're two, three, four years old, do they, do they say, well, what is that even? And what does that, uh, what does that mean for me? Right. Um, and then as they get older, it starts to have, even different meanings, right? Um, and then they say, well, if I'm boy or girl, then everyone else must be boy or girl. And so I am going to make sure that I can identify everybody else so that I'm in this cultural mindset, right? This social mindset that I know what's going on. And then everybody else hails and hails and hails, boy, girl, boy, 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 girl, boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, right? And and then we all agree upon this. But what happens when there is a change or a difference, right? When someone says, I'm gender non-conforming, I'm gender non-binary, I'm queer, I am trans, I'm two-spirit, right? I'm any number of things that do not conform to this notion of interpolation. And unfortunately, uh, Altisera does not, <laughs> does not really um, create a space for that in his theory which again is one thing he's been criticized about and, and where we've kind of seen lack and people have responded since Altisir about that, right? Um, but if we think about the, you know, the, the gender non-binary, gender non-conforming experience, um, one of the reasons why um, it is so difficult by and large for a society to just say, Oh, okay. You you don't you know you don't conform to one gender or another. Oh, cool. Is is according to Altser right? Because of this, right? Because we are so because in all of our daily practices, in everything that is taught to us, that we do, that we um, explore, that we learn for so long, at least in Western society, has been right, male, female. So anything that comes to disrupt that is going to be, you know, it's like the, it's like the, uh, it's like the, uh, the allegory of the cave, anything that, that comes to disrupt what we normally see is not going to be met with a lot of kindness. Um, doesn't mean that that society is correct in, in, in approaching that without kindness, right? Clearly, that's not what I'm saying. But, but it's this, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, a very entrenched system, I guess I'll say. Um, and in, I, again, in the second edition on page 1355, 
what I'll leave you with is what he says, which is you and I are always already subjects. You know, people, in other words, you'll get people who say like, well, what if you're like a Ted Kaczynski type and you go live in the woods and you'll, you know, live off the grid and you still had those years of social conditioning, right? You still exist even in a very odd way as a part of this society. Um, so we are all subjects, right? And again, we can, we can kind of argue that one way or another, but that's what Altisir says. Um, so now the next part, and I'll take it off stop share now, is to think about, I mean, if this is every part of our world, right? Again, church, family, school, religion, interactions with one another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera jobs, everything we do, the media, everything we do. This is everywhere and we're all subjects, right? Then we can apply that to our reading of Ava Luna. And we can think about the ideology of the place in which Ava Luna grows up and in which she exists and which other characters in this novel exist. Um, you know, what are those ideological state apparatuses? Um, Again, like school, religion, friends, media, government, et cetera. And then how do they shape each individual differently? Um, how, do, how are we interpolated, or I'm sorry, how are characters interpolated? And then how do they engage in that process themselves? Do they disengage in any way? Um, so these are things to think about as you read chapter three of Ava Luna. Um, I know, I know that it's heady stuff, right? Which is why I kind of gave a little bit more of explanation to Altusser, because again, he's one of those French mid 20th century guys. Um, sidebar, he also killed his wife. So that's just like something to, to keep in mind as you're reading him, you know, like, because I always feel bad when people are like, oh, Altusser, he blew my mind. He's so rad. And I'm just like, oh, he also is a wife murderer. So, uh, you know, like, uh, just... Take everything with it, you know, do research, understand the complexity of human existence and take everything with a grain of salt. That's, I guess that's what I'll leave you with today. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's all I have for, for this week. And I hope everyone's doing well. And again, if you have questions, comments, concerns, please message me and have a wonderful day and rest of your week. Okay, bye.